In 2016, two Argentinian female students went on a trip to South American countries in the hope of taking a little break from their studies. The girls had no idea that their trip would end in a nightmare and turn into one of the most complicated and intricate investigations on this continent. Maria Jose Coni and Marina Menegazzo are two young Argentine women from the city of Mendoza. In 2016, they were 22 and 21 years old, respectively. Maria Jose studied economics at the University of Cuyo, and Marina studied speech therapy at the University of Aconcagua. Both girls worked as volunteers for an organization that helps people on the streets. Friends and acquaintances described them as two very cheerful girls who were also very close to their families. On January 10, 2016, Maria Jose, Marina Menegazzo, and two other friends went on a trip. They had a few days free from their studies and decided that this year, 2016, they would go on an expedition to South American countries, namely Ecuador and Peru. The girls' social media accounts showed that everything was going well. They were very happy, showing the scenery as well as the places they visited in each country. On February 13, 2016, after just over a month of traveling together, the group split in two. Marina and Maria Jose stayed for a few days in Ecuador, while the other two girls traveled to Mendoza. This decision was not spontaneous, it was planned from the day they left Argentina. Maria Jose and Marina had a few more days before school started, and they decided to spend them in Ecuador and get to know some more places. As their two friends are returning to Mendoza, they decide to stop at the beach in the town of Montañita, where they had already visited a few days earlier. It was one of the first places they visited when they arrived in Ecuador. They were drawn to return to this place because of its paradisiacal beaches and holiday atmosphere. There are many people from different countries vacationing in Montañita, many of them backpackers like Marina and Maria Jose. To save some money and spend less of their budget, the girls sold fruit salads and hamburgers on the beach. By doing this, they were able to pay for the hostel they were staying at, which cost them $10 a night. As the days progressed, the girls continued to share photos on social media. They looked great, uploaded scenery, were at the beach, swimming, and seemed very happy. The adventure in Montañita was supposed to end on February 22nd. This was because the girls had a flight from Lima to Chile on February 25th. The plan to return to Mendoza was as follows. From Montañita, they were to go to Guayaquil, and from there, to Lima. In Lima, they were going to stay with friends for one night and then fly to Chile, and from there they would take a minibus to Mendoza, their home country, to their family. The trip seemed very well planned, and the girls had already booked plane tickets and everything they needed for the trip. Early in the morning of the 22nd, Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo talked to their families, packed their bags, and in the afternoon informed their parents that they would hitchhike from Montañita to Guayaquil because they had had $70 stolen from their hostel and wanted to save some money. According to the relatives, they offered to send them the money, but the girls refused, telling them not to worry. Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo also assured them that they would have no communication for the next few days, so it would be very difficult to reach them. Apparently, the families thought they would be able to talk when they were in Lima at a friend's house, or perhaps before their flight, but this did not happen. In the afternoon of February 22nd, all communication was lost. The flight to Chile was supposed to take place early in the morning on the 25th. Thus, the girls were supposed to be home in Argentina on February 26th, but that didn't happen. They never arrived. Already on the 27th, the families began to worry. The first to sound the alarm on social networks was Marina's sister. She posted a photo of the two girls with the following phrase. My sister and her friend disappeared on Monday 22nd in Montañita, Ecuador. Please spread the word. Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa responded a few hours later with the following message. The police are already investigating. Hug your parents and Maria Jose's parents. All of Ecuador is with you. The families of the girls wanted to know if they had left the country and if they had boarded the flight. However, it was not possible to speak to airline representatives, as they said they would only provide this information if there was a court order. In addition, there were no reports at the border that either of the girls had left Montañita for Guayaquil. The parents then came up with the idea that Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo had not even made it to Guayaquil and that something might have happened to them along the way. The disappearance went viral on social media. It was widely shared. 
and the two countries essentially joined forces to search for them, and to make the news even more viral, to make it known everywhere that these two young girls had not returned home. It all came to an end on February 25th, that was Thursday, and Maria Jose's body was found in an area about 200 meters away from the beach. And on Sunday, February 28th, Marina's body was found. It was about 40 meters away from where Maria Jose's body was found. This is where all the oddities of the case begin. For example, if the body was only 40 meters away, why was it found three days later? In order to determine the day of death of the girls, an autopsy had to be performed. It should be noted, this will help us further, Maria Jose's body was found by a man. He said he went into the area to urinate and found the body. Both girls were wrapped in bags in a sack and wrapped in ropes. Maria Jose was found to have a bruised skull, injuries to various parts of her body including the genital area, a fractured femur, several bruises and scratches. Marina suffered six sharp force injuries. The wounds were inflicted from her chin to the first cervical vertebrae. She also had several abrasions on her face and on various parts of her body. To add to this, the girls had wounds on their wrists, due to which it is believed that they were bound. Both were reported to have died on the same day, a few hours or minutes apart. The date of death was determined to be the early morning of February 23rd. A day after the second body was found, Ecuadorian police announced at a press conference and on social media that the first arrests had already been made in the case. Two people were arrested. The first was Alberto Segundo Mina Pons, and the second was Aurelio Eduardo Rodriguez, nicknamed El Rojo. Bloodstains were found in the house of one of the defendants, Mina Ponce, and Marina's cell phone and backpack, among other items, were found near the house. What is most shocking, aside from the quick apprehension, is the instant confession of the two men. They actually confessed to what they had done immediately, which made a huge impression on the people who were watching the events unfold. The men had a whole story to tell. They said that they saw Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo outside a bar. The girls tried to arrange a ride, asking for a ride to Guayaquil, but couldn't find anyone to go in that direction. According to the men, the first person who approached them to talk to them was El Rojo. He asked them what they were doing and according to him, the girls started telling him where they were from, what they were doing and allegedly say that they had nowhere to stay, as they had no money, as they had been robbed in the morning. El Rojo then suggested that they stay at Mina Ponce's house, which was relatively close by. And furthermore, he explained that Mina Ponce lived alone, and therefore there would be no problem going to that person's house. El Rojo then took them by cab to the man's house. When they arrived, it was approximately 8.30 p.m. The man claims he left them in the house and locked them in. He then returned to the bar and stayed there with Mina Ponce for several hours. About 2 a.m., they returned to the house. The girls were there and asked them to go with them to buy sodas. Afterward, upon returning to the house, the situation became tense, according to the two men. The men said that since they were very drunk, they wanted to have sexual intercourse with the girls, which they obviously did not want to do. Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo had not been drinking and were fine, so they began to resist. Maria Jose was allegedly the first to die. Mina Ponce confessed that he killed her with a metal object he had in his house, hitting her on the head when she resisted sexual intercourse. After realizing that Maria Jose was no longer alive, he heard a scream from the next room. It was Marina's scream. El Rojo had stabbed her six times, from her chin to her first cervical vertebrae. The two men had killed the female tourists and didn't know what to do. According to them, El Rojo left the house and left Mina Ponce alone with the corpses, which was at around 3 a.m. Then Mina Pons said that he started cleaning the house, wrapped the bodies in bags, tied them with ropes and took them away in a wheelbarrow. He first dumped Maria Jose's body and then tried to dispose of Marina's body. He thought that the murders would go unnoticed and no one would ever know that they had done it. This version, according to the prosecution, in addition to the confession of both men, had two witnesses. These are the owner of the bar, as well as the driver of the cab that took them to the house. The owner of the bar said that she had seen the girls since about 2.30 p.m. They asked people to give them a ride, but several hours passed and they never found anyone. Very tired, Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo went into the bar and asked for a glass of water. The owner of the bar offered them a bottle, 
but the girls refused, saying they had no money to pay for it because they had been robbed in the morning. The woman then gave them a glass of water and they returned to the street. Afterward, El Rojo approached them. The owner of the bar saw the three of them talking, and then they all left together in the direction of Mina Ponce's house. The cab driver had a similar story. He said he was stopped while they were walking. El Rojo sat in the front, and Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo sat in the back. It's worth noting, both girls were silent the entire way. In addition, the cab driver thought they were a little sleepy. He dropped them off at the house without asking any questions, and went back to his business. For the family, this version was completely wrong. They did not accept it. They found it very strange that Maria and Marina accepted the help of these people. There are many Argentine tourists in Montañita, and for them it would have been more logical for the girls to approach a man of their own nationality, tell him what had happened, and ask for help. It was also very strange that they said they had no money. Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo had credit cards and could withdraw money at any time. In addition, there is another piece of evidence that can refute this, namely that Maria Jose's credit card was used to make a transaction at an ATM that was very close to the hostel where they were staying in Montañita. Thus, it was clear to everyone that the girls had enough money to pay for a night at a local hotel. This version began to fall apart in the public eye as well. The brother of one of the victims said that when the Ecuadorian police brought him to the scene of the crime in the house, he saw used syringes lying on the floor. When he asked about the syringes, they magically disappeared, they were not even photographed at the crime scene, and the experts who examined the scene denied their existence. For the family, the two men were just a front for something bigger, like a human trafficking business. While all this was going on, the investigation continued. A second autopsy was scheduled as well as a toxicological examination. In addition, it turned out that both defendants repeatedly changed their version of events. In one version, Mina Ponce stopped accusing El Rojo and himself of the murders. He stated that the person who had taken the girls' lives was a trafficker in illegal substances of Venezuelan origin who lived in the area. Only his alias, El Chamo, was known. He was apprehended by the police, but stated that he had nothing to do with what happened and was willing to take a lie detector test or DNA test to make them realize that he was not in the house at all. Several DNA samples were recovered at the crime scene. Mina Ponce's DNA, DNA from the two deceased girls, and several unidentified samples. These samples did not belong to El Rojo, the alleged second killer, nor to El Chamo, who after passing all the DNA tests was completely removed from the investigation. After the results of the second autopsy came back, the day of death changed, and this was one of the things that shocked everyone the most. While Maria Jose's date of death was still February 23rd, Marina's date of death changed to February 25. This means that when Maria Jose's body was found, Marina was probably only a few days away from death. It may also explain the reason why, despite the fact that they were found only 40 meters apart, Marina's body was not found on the day Maria Jose's body was found. This was a very strange circumstance, and people concluded that perhaps Marina had been kidnapped, abused, and beaten during those two days. Ecuadorian police actively claimed that they had not found Marina because of the rain. But when checking weather records on the day Maria Jose was found, it was not raining. So a second autopsy may be very credible. Other facts were discovered. The bruises and scratches that Maria Jose had were only on one side of her body, as if she had been thrown from a moving car. It was also found that the girls had injuries in the genital area, which confirms the violence. In addition, something very strange was discovered. Maria Jose had a fractured femur, as was already evident in the first autopsy, but no injury that could have caused it was observed. Even more surprising was the toxicology analysis. The girls were under the influence of illegal substances. A substance was found in their bodies which, when mixed with alcohol, forms a mixture capable of depriving a person of their own will. This explains why Maria Jose and Marina Menegazzo got into the cab so easily, why they were silent the whole way, and why they looked tired or sleepy. Their family described them as very cautious and responsible girls, so none of this was in keeping with their character. Now, after toxicology analysis, it can be argued that these men had somehow drugged the girls with illegal substances. There were many setbacks in the case. The prosecutor changed three times, which greatly delayed the trial. But in the end, 
Alberto Segundo Mina Pons, and Aurelio Eduardo Rodriguez were sentenced to 40 years in prison. However, the case didn't end there. After the trial and conviction, a reinvestigation had to be carried out. Recall that there were several DNA samples in the house that had not yet been identified. Two more arrests were made, but one of the defendants was completely exonerated because the DNA tests came back negative and he also had a very solid alibi. Another person involved in the crime was brought to trial because his DNA came back positive. This man's name is Jose Luis Perez. Recall that Maria Jose was found by a man who allegedly went into the area to relieve himself. That man turned out to be Jose Luis Perez. He had already testified in the trial against El Rojo and Mina Ponce as a witness, but now he was to sit in the dock. His defense was simple. He had lived in the house a few weeks before, and the blood found on the wall was the result of a tooth infection he had suffered. He allegedly just spit on the wall. The lawyers also said that his DNA found on the girls' bodies was undoubtedly transferred from some piece of furniture or item he had touched in the house, which Maria and Marina had also touched. This man's defense began to crumble when his dentist came to testify. Jose Luis Perez had indeed come to see him, but two weeks after the murders had been committed, he asked for a certificate in which the dentist was supposed to write that he had a tooth infection. But the doctor did not want to give him the certificate because he had examined him and saw that there was nothing wrong with him. The man said that Jose Luis Perez insisted, but in the end, he just sent him away. At those words, the man's defense collapsed. To top it all off, it was too much of a coincidence that he had found the body of the first girl. It was a very long process, and only in November 2019 the verdict was handed down against Jose Luis Perez. He will also have to serve 40 years in prison for the murder of the girls. We can say that this case is solved, but it is only half solved because there are still DNA samples that need to be identified. And there are still a lot of questions. What happened on the night and early morning of February 23rd in this house? What happened to the girls? What happened to Marina in the two days she was alive and Maria Jose was not? Were there other people and how were they kidnapped? How were they captured? Was it all planned? All of these questions are left hanging in the air. And the families of both girls continue to fight for justice in this case. What do you think about all the undisclosed issues? Perhaps you have a guess. Could the cab driver or the bar owner be involved? Write your opinion in the comments. See you in the next video.